And let's talk a bit about common analytical instrumentation that you may encounter in your lab. There are a lot of instruments that could potentially be used in lab depending upon what your analysis is. Some common ones that you may encounter are instruments such as HPLC, GCs, LCMS, GCMS, AA, ICPOES, ICPMS, FTIR, and UVVIS. I know that's a lot of letters I just threw around, but stay with me. HPLC, or High Performance Liquid Chromatography, is a separatory technique. It relies upon a solid stationary and a liquid mobile phase, and you effectively use this combination to identify and quantify analytes in your liquid phase. Well, I know that sounds a bit like Greek. What does it mean? As I mentioned, this is a separatory technique. It relies upon differential analyte sorption and desorption. Essentially, you have a column made of usually silica-coated material. Your analyte or your analytes will sorb and desorb to this column quickly or not so quickly. Uh, they will sorb strongly or weakly. All this is based on their chemical structure. The idea here is that you use your liquid phase, aka your solvent, and pass your analyte combination over the column. Based on the chemical structure, some analytes will come out quickly and be detected. Others will come out later and be detected. Effectively, you get separation. This technique is used in the world of small molecules, lipids, vitamins, degradation products, toxins, just about everything under the sun, honestly. It's arguably one of the most common techniques that you will see out there. Gas chromatography, or GC, like HPLC, is a separatory technique, except whereas HPLC is designed for liquid phase analytes, over here you're measuring gas phase analytes. Separation is again induced by differential analyte sorption and desorption, the difference being that previously the column used for separation was designed for liquid analytes. Over here, it's designed for gas phase analytes. The analytes that are measured by this instrumentation are volatile and thermally stable, which lends itself mostly to small organic molecules. Now, both of these techniques, HPLC, which is known as LC for short, and GC, are separatory techniques. They tell you what you have, but are not as helpful in identifying what the structure of analyte is. For this, you need a mass spectrometer, also called an MS, which is attached or mated to your chromatography instrument. A mass spectrometer attached to an LC is called a liquid chromatography mass spectrometer, or an LCMS. Similarly, if a mass spec is attached to a GC, you have gas phase uh, or gas chromatography mass spectrometry, GCMS. Using an MS adds ion measurement capabilities. Once mated to an HPLC or a GC, the combination of this allows you to not just identify and quantify how much you have in there or what you have in there, you can actually get down deep and identify what the chemical structure of your target analyte is. And this is done by measuring ions. Just a quick side note, you may encounter a technique called LCMSMS. This is not a transcription error. This is in fact a valid technique. The type of mass spectrometer used over here is more powerful than one used in typical LCMS since it has fragmentation capabilities which really allow you to improve your structural characterization capabilities. Now the principles of operation for the most part are similar to LCMS, but of course keep in mind this is a more powerful technique than LCMS which means method development is quite complicated. Next, let's move on into the world of spectroscopy. One of the first in instruments you may encounter is an atomic absorption spectrometer, also called an AA. This is used to measure content, uh, metallic content in samples. Essentially, elemental light is used to 
irradiate samples and based on how much light is lost you can back calculate what and how much you analyze. These tend to be single element instruments. They're designed to measure one element at a time, although you can program it to switch between elements usually. And they come in two flavors. Flame atomic absorption, also called FAA, and graphite furnace atomic absorption, also called GFAA. First, let's talk about flame atomic absorption spectroscopy, or FAA. In this technique, a flame about 2500 degrees Celsius uh, in temperature is used to atomize your sample. The atomized samples are irradiated with elemental specific light, and the amount of light absorbed is used to back calculate what and how much uh, of your particular metal you have in there. This technique is used to measure high levels of metal content, usually from the ppm to percent levels. Graphite Furnace Atomic Absorption Spectroscopy, or GFAA, is the brother to Flame Atomic Absorption Spectroscopy. Of course, this brother seems to have a really long name, but whatever. This particular instrument relies upon electrothermal atomization. Instead of using a flame, it's using high voltages um, to generate a tremendous amount of heat and to effectively atomize your sample. This is all done in a graphite coated furnace, as shown in the image on the bottom right corner of the screen. Just as before, however, once your atoms are generated, elemental light is used to excite said atoms, light absorption is measured, and back, calcula back calculated to determine the concentration of your metal. This technique is designed to measure low levels of metal content. I'm referring to parts per billion, PPB and below. Additionally, this technique relies upon extremely low sample volumes microliters, to be quite honest, which distinguishes it from other atomic spectroscopy techniques. Now let's move on to arguably the successor to atomic absorption spectroscopy, ICP-OES. This is going to be a bit of a mouthful, but ICP-OES stands for Inductively Coupled Plasma Optical Emission Spectrometry. Well, that's quite a bit. This technique was again designed for the measurement of metal content in sample, but in this case, an argon plasma atomizes and ionizes your elements. Whereas before light absorption was being evaluated, now elemental light emission is evaluated. Just want to add a quick note. Atomic absorption, or AA instruments that I explained earlier, can also utilize light emission for quantifying analytes. However, this is less commonly used since there is an elemental limitation with regards to how many elements can actually emit light using a flame. So ICPOES is used more frequently if emission is being considered. These instruments are multi-element instruments. They can analyze uh, many different elements usually at the same time, or at least extremely quickly. They are robust instruments and are designed to measure medium to high levels of metal content. So we're talking low to mid PPBs, depending upon the analyte, to high PPM levels. It depends. This is not to be confused with ICPMS, which stands for Inductively Coupled Plasma Mass Spectrometry. Again, quite a mouthful. An ICPMS is also used for analyzing metals, but in this case, an argon plasma ionizes your elements and elemental ions are evaluated. Remember in ICPOES, yes, we were using an argon plasma, but we were looking at light emission. In MS, we are looking for elemental ions. ICPMS systems are multi-element instruments and are designed for measuring extremely low levels of metal analyte content. I'm talking parts per billion to parts per trillion, quite often even below that, depending upon the industry. This power does come at a cost, however. It tends to make them the most expensive of the three major atomic spectroscopy instruments. Now let's move from the world of atomic spectroscopy to molecular spectroscopy. The first instrument to consider is called the FTIR, which stands for Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy. And now, that's quite a mouthful, so honestly, folks in industry usually just refer to this as IR spectroscopy. 
It is used heavily for sample identification and characterization. Simply speaking, your sample is irradiate, irradiated with IR radiation, and the IR absorbance or transmittance pattern that you observe is specific to your analyte chemical structure, a fingerprint of sorts. This fingerprint is used to evaluate and characterize your structure. FTIR instruments are, dare I say, fun instruments. They come in multiple form factors, which is to say multiple different sizes, and they can come with many different types of accessories depending upon your analytical needs. You may encounter three different types of IR instruments, which all differ in the region of radiation they're scanning. This region is referred to as wave number in the IR world, which is, again, just a way of measuring waves, for lack of a better word. It's the exact opposite of wavelength. Near IR measures between 12,500 to 4,000 wave numbers. This is getting pretty close to the wavelength, or wave number for that matter, of visible light. Mid IR, which is arguably used most commonly in industry, is measuring between 4,400 wave numbers. And far IR is measuring between 400 to 10 uh, wave numbers. It's quite far away from visible light. That's why it's called far IR. This technique is used to evaluate polymer, lipid, protein, small molecules, and many other compounds. Then we have the trusty UV spectrometer, which also is commonly uh, used in lab and academic environments. UEVIS stands for ultraviolet and visible wavelengths, respectively. UEVIS instruments, much like FTIR, are used for identification and quantitation, except over here, the sample is radiated with ultraviolet and or visible spectrum radiation. Depending upon the amount of uh, light absorbed or transmitted, a spectra is generated which is used for identification and quantification of your analyte. It could also be used for qualitative work. In fact, most techniques can be used for qualitative work where you're trying to just get a guesstimate at what you have in there or to uh, understand more about the chemical structure of your different elements. So multiple different uses for this instrument. Like IR, UVVIS comes in multiple form factors and has multiple accessories used to quantify or evaluate just about everything under the sun, from biological molecules, organic compounds, coatings, glass. It's also used for kinetics and degradation studies. Very common in DNA labs, actually. So I hope I've illustrated that there is a variety of instrumentation available in a lab environment. You may encounter um, all of these or some of these instruments. The Instrument choice, the choice of which technology to use, ultimately comes down to three factors. Number one is what material are you analyzing? Solid, liquid, gas. What analytes and levels are you considering? Are you trying to get down to low levels? Are you trying to get down to high levels? And are you trying to identify your analyte, quantify your analyte, or both? Are these the only instruments that you will encounter? Absolutely not. They are simply common instruments. You may encounter other ones based on a lab environment, which have their own advantages and disadvantages.